So um, it's a, a real pleasure to uh, chair this session with uh, Matthew Parker, who we, we've only met recently, but um, I've absolutely devoured all of his work for the past 10 years. Um, he's been writing for a long time. He's very old, obviously, so he's very accomplished as well. Um, and when I was invited to chair on his brilliant new book, uh, One Fine Day, I, th my first thought was revenge, really, because... Um, the first time I met Matthew was at my book launch last year. And um, I didn't know him. I'd never sort of met him before. And I could see this guy walking around with a backpack full of books. Uh, at my book launch, he was handing out copies of his book. And I thought, who's, who's this guy? The kind of ghoul to do this. Um, and then he kind of slid out to me, introduced himself, and uh, offered me a free book. So I thought that's fine. So I thought, as some revenge, then I'll be standing at the back as you all exit, handing out copies of my book for free. Uh, actually, if you look under your chair, there's a free copy of my... No, there's not really. A, I can't afford that. I'm an author. Um, so uh, anyway, so today we'll be talking for about 40 minutes or so about Matthew's book. And at the end, um, time being well, we'll sort of open up to some questions, not comments. No one likes a comment or an opinion. Just really enthusiastic questions that we can ask. Easy questions. No hardballs, just easy questions. Um, so, I mean, I'd quite like to start... Um, and, I mean, one of the reasons why I absolutely love this book, and I read a lot of books last year. This was easily one of my favourite books um, uh, of last year. Um, I write on the British Empire. Um, I write on the earlier period. Uh, Matthew's book is, uh, is really just a, a massive achievement in looking at the latest story of the British Empire, which, in a way, is a story we're fed all the time. You know, the, the decline of the British Empire, spectacularly going out in a blaze of glory, fighting the world wars, and, and that sort of traditional uh, narrative. But Matthew's found a way to take a very large, very well-known story and tell it in a completely novel, a completely fresh and innovative way. And I just found it captivating. So when I was preparing for this talk, I took down so many notes um, and I was essentially rewriting the book. Uh, all these fantastic little stories in which is really a big story. Um, and how do you tackle something as big as the British Empire in the 1920s? Um, and uh, a few historians can accomplish it. Those who have tried it, I don't think have always done it justice. But so what I'm really curious to ask you, Matthew, really is about this idea of, for those of you who haven't had a chance uh, to read the book, and shame on you if you're here and you haven't read it, is uh, you set the book, uh, I mean, it's called One Fine Day, um, and um, you set the book on, on one day in 1923. So I wonder whether you could talk us through that particular approach. Yeah, th thanks for that uh, very generous introduction, David. Um, yeah, I wanted to do something a bit different. There's been a lot of... Uh, history books about the empire being written by uh, middle, middle-aged, middle-class white persons like myself. So I wanted to stand out from that crowd. And um, the really, the, uh, obviously, I want, I want the book to get noticed in the bookshop. I want the people to do a double take. And I think a lot of particularly British readers would be very surprised that it was only 100 years ago, sort of pretty much in you know, two or three generations ago, where the British Empire found itself um, this enormous space and the sole world global superpower. Um, the, my other ambition was to um, include many more of colonized voices than a lot of um, British historians have done, with the spectacular exception of David and his book, The, the Great Defiance, which no, is all it. from the stop other it. side. Um, so, so, so what I did, I, the other ambition was not to come to this subject as a polemicist, or with sort of preconceived ideas of what the, sort of the message that I wanted to get across. Um, so instead of arriving at the subject and finding primary sources to justify my argument, I wanted to start with the primary sources and see where they took me. So what, what I undertook to do was to go through archives um, all, over the, all over the world and read newspapers. It was a real, it was the real sort of the moment of glory for newspapers. Radio is in, in its infancy. Obviously, there's no telly or internet or anything like that. Um, so there's this huge, rich resource of newspapers. Um, I mean, somewhere like um, Sierra Leone has about 10 papers just in that small country. Um, so I went through all of those, and I read magazines, and I looked at novels and diaries and letters from this day. Uh, and a friend of mine, a historian friend of mine, said when I was setting out to do this, oh, this that's going to be very restrictive, keeping yourself to such a narrow um, period. But in fact, 
it was it was really good for me because it really directed me towards sort of areas that I would not have gone otherwise. So, for instance, I'll, g I'll give you a few examples. I found a letter in the miscellaneous correspondence file for, for this day at the archives in, in London, and it was from a phosphate, the phosphate company, the nationalized phosphate company, um, to the colonial office, asking for um, the district officer in Ocean Island, which is in Kiribati, um, for more land to mine. And I thought, what, what's, what's this about? And then I discovered that um, this small island now called Banabar, which is right on the, um, where the sun first rises on the empire on this day. Um, the soil it had been discovered was almost pure phosphate, a really valuable uh, resource for making fertilizers. And the island was being dug up and taken away, the actual physical body of the island. I mean, there's lots of arguments in the empire about land, but here it's actually literally being shipped away forever. And the people living there are going, hold on, stop. You know, we, we want, this is our home, and you're just leaving this barren wasteland. Um, and so the, the, the English district officers put in this impossible situation. Um, he's, as, as one wrote, he has to choose between his, um, his integrity or his career, because previous ones who had defended the islanders found themselves demoted and posted to the worst place in the empire, the Falkland Islands, which is the, where, you, where you get sent if you've been really bad. Um, so so that, that was one example. Another example, I found a, a, a telegram from the colonial office to the governor of Kenya demanding an immediate explanation for the lenient sentence given to a white settler who had beaten his black, one of his black workers to death. That's one, another example. Another, another from Kenya. Um, I found in the Nairobi archive the minutes of a meeting held by the East African Indian Cong National Congress, which was an organization founded by a man called A.M.G. Banji, who uh, originally an Indian, um, who was fighting for the rights of the large and important uh, Indian community in Kenya, which is, a, a, again, an amazing story. Um, and looking at the newspapers, there's so much sport. The one newspaper I found in, from, from Salon, as it was called, had no domestic news at all apart from cricket. And there was one, there was one story that particularly caught my eye, which was a, a, a Tamil Sinhalese match and a Tamil batsman who had given the ball an enormous whack so it cleared the trees and landed on the roof of the home for incurables. So um, let's hope that England are doing that sort of baseball attack today. Um, so uh, all of these things were, I used as jumping off points. So I went to look at the labor situation in Kenya. I, I went to, there was, another, there was another article entitled Dying Races, which was reporting a conference in Australia to um, address the catastrophic population decline in the Pacific Islands that was underway at that time. Um, so this led me to lots of different, I hope, um, places that people hadn't necessarily read about before in this sort of book. I think that that's one of the really interesting things that your book does, which uh, historians who work on the British Empire but don't necessarily work on the later period, finding the voices of colonised people is bloody difficult. It's really difficult because it tends to be the Europeans that have a monopoly on the kind of written sources. And so what I found so, I mean, annoying, I hated that you had such good access to these sources, but... This was a period in the uh, early 20th century where colonized people are, you know, engaged in writing newspapers. Uh, you know, there was just such a wealth of material. You could, you know, the diaries of you know, Nehru and all of these sort of people. Yeah, that were there's a, there's a, I should have mentioned there's a report in the paper of the latest arrest of Nehru that had happened, happened the day before. So that gave me a chance to look at him, um, who, who has actually becomes quite a big figure in the book as well. Yeah, and, and it shows immediately this isn't a, a story of the British Empire from a British perspective, although they're a central character in the story. It's a story told from hundreds of different perspectives, which creates a much bigger picture, kind of, you know, when you want to read a history of something, you hope you're reading a complete picture. That's, that never happens. You're always reading an interpretation, what the sources allow. But looking at the British Empire from this one day in 1923, it, 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 it's, a, it's a far more comprehensive picture than I think we've ever had before. Yeah, um, well, it, I, I couldn't make it an en en encyclopedic book. I can't go to every territory I mean, in, this, was. in this huge... No, I, it, you, you can't. So I, I kind of, as I said, I had this huge amount of primary source material, and I picked out the stories that, that, that most interested me and most surprised me. Mm -hmm. And it's really that, that's, it is about, the book is about stories and people, 
um, that we've talked about Nehru. There's also um, E.M. Forster is writing a passage to India. Um, George Orwell is a policeman in Burma where there's this massive crime wave. Um, there's a fascinating woman called Adelaide Casey Hayford who is opening um, on this very day a technical school for girls in, in Freetown, Sierra Leone. So, and her story is, is really jumped out at me and is, is absolutely fascinating and very nuanced. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we were, there's another panel today, I think um, uh, Jace Fig Quinn talking about uh, uh, with uh, Mary Beard and Peter Frank Oban, and they were talking about how do you write these massive stories, these big global histories. Um, and I think it was uh, Peter, I'm just scanning the crowd, Peter's over there, hi Peter, um, who, who said, I don't want to heap praise on you now, because there we go, so bear, but that we kind of, big, good, good global histories are patchworks of smaller stories, and I think a, we have to do that because we are human and we can't write these endless massive stories, but you also have to kind of put parameters on. But at a kind of textual level, they should be interesting stories uh, writ on a kind of much, much kind of wider passage. I think your book does that, that brilliant. I mean, some of those snippets, and I've got about 50 written down here, um, just, you just open up this world in a way you don't get from stuffy foreign office, you know, colonial records and archives. Um, talking about accounts and uh, agriculture and, and law and order and that sort of thing. So it gave it a really rich, um, almost kind of subaltern bottom-up perspective of, of the British Empire. But um, I, I just, it's very unnerving having a, cl a clock ticking down in front of you. So I'm just going to try and do what I've never accomplished in my academic careers to stick to, to time here. So I want to ask you, for those who may not, not know, um, 1923, the subtitle of this book is Britain's Empire on the Brink. What, can you set that up for us? What, what, what's going on? I, yeah, you know. um, in, in, in many ways, it, it, it is, it is the, it, a, a sort of peak moment. It's a peak moment territorially. There is um, 460 million people um, awaking that morning as subjects of em King Emperor George V. And that's more than the population of the United States, the French Empire, and Russia combined. Um, so it's an astonishing number of people. There's huge resources in, within the scope of the empire. There's 50% of the world's rice, 70% of its rubber, most of it's gold. Can we get Royal uh, Britannia playing in the background? Is that a there's, I'm, just, I'm just doing I'm with one half. It's, um, there's going to be a but coming. There's a but coming. Good. Um, four, four, four of the five busiest ports are in the empire um, and in, in London is the most populous city in the world and still the center of, of finance information and cables um, so in many ways people might um, you know the, the, the people are arriving to for the Imperial Conference the leaders of the Dominions in India the sort of very much the top table of the empire and they might feel that they had a lot to celebrate but really what, what, what is key what has happened is the First World War and this has had a massive impact, both financially, politically, psychologically. Um, and all, all, a lot of the, um, the, 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 the money has gone. Um, Britain owes a huge amount of money to the United States, has a massive debt. Um, and I was actually researching this bit when Brexit was happening. And one of the, one of the key problems that's uh, facing British commerce is the collapse of the European market. The European market, which has almost always been more important for British trade than the empire, is in ruins. It's got hyperinflation, you've got civil wars, you've got militia marching on the streets, including Hitler's brown shirts. Um, there's been massive currency devaluation. So that market is, has, has disappeared with the result that there's two million unemployed in Britain. Um, and this is at the same time that... Uh, mass franchise has been introduced. Only in 1918 were all adult males and most um, females under the age, over the age of 30 have been given the vote. So there's a, there's a whole new constituency that has to be um, dealt with by the government. And, and people are sort of slightly asking, well, you know, we've got democracy at home, but we've got autocracy uh, in the empire. This, this is jarring. And so on that note, the, 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 obviously the First World War has swept away uh, many empires. In 1914, most of the world is part of one empire or another. But obviously, the Ottoman Empire has collapsed, the German, the Austro-Hungarian, the Russian. Um, and we have Wilson turning up at Versailles talking about self-determination for people. Now, he didn't mean, he, he meant Europe. He certainly didn't mean, you know, the British Empire in the Philippines or in Samoa or anywhere like that. Um, but this, these ideas spread. Um, and also coming out of Versailles is this idea of, of Man, the mandate system. 
So instead of, uh, of direct rule, um, these the new mandates, the, the bits of the um, the old empires, the Ottoman and the, the German that have been taken, have been swallowed up by the British Empire, they ha they have a, a definite mission, and that is to bring these places to home rule as quickly as possible. That's what they're told they have to do. Uh, and this idea, it sort of spreads. It spreads out of the mandates into all of the other colonies. So the idea of empire, it seems out of date. You know, it's, it's associated with tyranny and with, you know, governing against the will of the governed. Um, and it, it seems the future belongs to different forms of government, to democracy, to communism, to fascism. Um, and so, so empire defenders are, are struggling to, to sort of keep their feet on the ground. And at the same time, of course, the war has in many ways destroyed uh, white prestige, which is this crucial element of the empire. Um, and there's a lovely quote from Norman Manley, uh, who fought for the British in the, in the First World War, and his, as did his brother who was killed, uh, and later, of course, is the first Prime Minister of Jamaica. And he, he quotes a British official that he overheard saying, the British Empire and British rule depends on the carefully nurtured sense of inferiority in the governed. Uh, and Jawal Nehru said something very similar. He said, it was amazing how in, <clears throat> so many Indians thought it sort of natural that they, was, they were second rate. And he goes on to say, um, more than the diplomatic or the military triumph of the British in India, it, there was a psychological triumph. Uh, and this, of course, is now beginning to be challenged. Yeah, I, I think that's one of the remarkable things about the book is in, if you shift sources, if you shift perspective, then you get what really has been a Victorian monopoly on imperial ideology uh, of the white man's burden, of the superiority of, of European civilization. We heard that word civilization a bit today. Um, and then the, immediately when you shift to the voices of the colonized people, it, it, it becomes ridiculous. It's, it's easily undermined and disproven that, you know, the British claim to bring, to bring medicine, to bring, you know, education, law and order. Um, can you talk about the ways in which some of these stories essentially render that kind of uh, obsolete? Yeah, well, I think, um, you know, the, 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 this idea that, it, that there is a sort of psychological, um, I mean, Kenyatta called it sort of psychological subservience that had been sort of beaten into Ken black Kenyans. Um, but this, this, is, this is being challenged, and it really sort of goes back to, I mean, it sounds like an obscure, a slightly obscure reference, but the, Jap the Japanese-Russian War in 1905, which seems almost a footnote, but actually is of vital importance. It's the first time a white power is defeated by a non-white power. And all over the world, this has an impact. W.E. Du Bois in America says, this was a, a huge moment of a burgeoning of black pride. Um, and Nehru says something very similar. And, and so what, what you see happening is you see resistance to this um, imposed sense of inferiority. And this starts in all sorts of ways, um, in sort of literary societies, um, people getting together to celebrate indigenous art and culture, um, the discarding of Western dress in favor of a native dress in Africa and, and, and elsewhere. And gradually, the, these sort of literary or non-political organizations become more political. So you see, by 1923, sort of congresses all over the world, in spite, of course, enlarged by the Indian National Congress. So you have one in West Africa, you have one in um, Burma and in Sri Lanka. Uh, and often, the, this new sense, of this, this effort to recover sort of local pride um, it is attached to a local religion with sometimes unhappy circumstances. I'll give you the example of Sri Lanka, where there is a Buddhist, a militant Buddhist movement, which sounds like a contradiction in terms, but actually isn't. Uh, and there's a guy called Anger Park, I can't pronounce his name, but um, he, he's saying to the British, oh, hold, you know, they were, you, were, you were barbarians living in caves when we were building these amazing temples and, and reservoirs and so on, which is completely true, and it's obviously the same as the case in India. Um, but his, his sort of religious revivalism, unfortunately, becomes a, a, a addressed not just to the British, but to the minority Tamil Hindu and to the minority Muslim population in Sri Lanka, with obviously very unhappy effects. Um, but this is, this is happening you know, all over the empire where um, people are um, rejecting the idea that they are inferior. 
Um, now you, and you talked about the sort of just one of one of the things I spotted in a paper from 29th September 1923 was a manifesto by the British Empire Union, which is you can probably um, gather is a sort of propagandist on behalf of the of, of the empire, and they're saying we should teach these British children to be proud of the way that the empire is um, improving health, education, it's imposing Pax Britannica, and it's imposing the rule of law. But all of these, I, this is something that emerged from this massive primary source material. All of these are actually more complicated than you'd think. And I'm, I'm just going to go on with that, if that's okay. No, go for it, yeah. Um, if you look, for instance, at the Pax Britannica, um, there's a, a, a Kenyan a, a nationalist called Mockery, who points out that, yes, isn't it fantastic that tribal warfare has ended and we don't have to have these huge buffer zones between the Kikuyu and the Maasai and, and so on. But um, what the, the people who were, the Kenyans who were killed when they were recruited as porters fighting the Germans in what is now Tanzania, that was more than generations and generations of tribal warfare. Was it 70,000? Uh, something something like a quarter of the male population of Kenya um, was recruited and then uh, treated absolutely abysmally and, and, and perished. Um, and if you, if you look at health, now this is, a, uh, there's, there's a guy um, who was actually a resident, com a French guy, a resident commissioner in Morocco, it's a very interesting character, and he says, actually, medicine is the only excuse for colonization. He sees this as an unarguable good brought by the superior scientific medicine of the West. But actually, if you unpack that, um, what, what, first of all, the motivations and the practicalities. The practicalities are that the health budgets are absolutely minuscule. There's an archive of, um, in, in London of letters from volunteer nurses who've gone out to England to the empire, and they all report back the, the incredibly squalid conditions of the, of the hospitals that they're, they're called to work in. Um, and then if you look at the motivation, there's something I, I, I sort of do a little bit of a sidetrack to sort of to bash the Americans, because obviously that always goes down well. Um, there's some, the Rockefeller Institute. Obviously, Rockefeller is one of the richest men in the world from oil. And he sets up this phil philanthropic institute to, um, and they have one mission, which is to destroy hookworm. Um, but if you look at the actual motivation for that, um, hookworm isn't, is rarely fatal, but what it does is it it's debilitates you, it makes you anemic and so on. So you, uh, crucially, you become a less efficient worker in the plantations. And much of the motivation was improving the labor force for the white plantation owners, um, with the result that women and children are, 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 are neglected by this program. There's also another motive, which is medicine is identified very early on as an excellent way to sort of penetrate into places. And there is a, um, the, the guy who was running the Rockefeller um, actually sort of wrote to, wrote to his boss, Rockefeller, and said that the, he hoped the hookworm program would get people to abandon superstition and outdated, me outdated medical concepts and embrace scientific medicine as superior. From here, it was a small jump to, for, to them accepting the transplantation of Western civilization in general, which Gates defined as, our improved methods of production and agriculture, manufacture and commerce, our better social and political institutions, our better literature, philosophy, science, art, refinement, morality, and religion. So this is the motivation, and he, he actually says that a doctor is much better at overcoming local resistance than a man with a machine gun. So, that, so that's health and law, and we, uh, health and, and peace. Law is the same. You look at the, um, I, I sort of alluded to it briefly, but if you look at the courts in, in Kenya, trying a white man who has killed or, or injured very severely one of his black workers, because it was standard practice to, to, to use the kiboko, the rhino, rhino hide whip on, on your, your Kenyan workers. Um, and they have an all-white jury trying them, while everyone else, the Asian population, the black population, are not allowed that privilege. So, so the rule of law, that's, you can easily pick that apart as well. Um, education is another one where, again, resources are, are very, very small. Um, one of the exciting things that's happening on this day in Lagos, Nigeria, is the celebrations for the victory and election of the first West, An West African political party run by a guy called Herbert Macaulay, who is a really, really fascinating character, now known as the Gandhi of, of, of Nigeria. Um, and they call for universal compulsory primary education. 
and the governor, who's a guy called uh, Governor Clifford, who features in the book quite a lot, he's, he's in the process of having multiple nervous breakdowns. Um, and he says, well, actually, that would, that would, we'd need 44,000 teachers and a huge, something like 50% of, the, of the, the annual budget of the colony. And in fact, the, the, the rate of, of ed education spend is at 3%. So, so this is, tot a, firstly, it's totally inadequate. And secondly, it's also rather like the health. It's directed at um, this, this psychological battle. So for instance, if you go to a school in, in, Cape, in anywhere in West Africa, you will be taught the, the dates and names of all the kings and queens of England. Um, one of them reported being t taught the height of the Chilterns. Um, and, and always, you're, the, these children are being taught that um, everything um, British or white is superior um, and everything else is um, inferior. Um, and this, this creates all sorts of uh, um, problems, of course. Uh, and th there is growing resistance to this as well. I, I think I mentioned Adelaide Casey Hayford. She's setting up this technical school for girls with the express purpose of teaching them pride in African art, in African history, in African culture, um, to, to, to try and break down this sort of psychological um, approach behind education across the empire. It's the same in the Caribbean. I mean, um, Eric Williams complains that um, children are being taught songs about tripping home in the snow to Santa Claus um, in, in Jamaica. And again, that every, 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 everything important happened in Europe, not in Africa, not in the Caribbean. Um, so the, the, those are the sort of the, the pillars of empire justification that I wanted to examine in this book. And it, it's just so surprising how quickly it all, it's all kind of falls apart and it's this kind of propaganda. To, I mean, even just with the medicine you were talking about, most of the med medical advances are made in places like the Pacific, the Pacific to treat diseases that Europeans bring with them, right? So it's not really, there's no altruistic, they're, they're using this to justify or promote Western rule, but actually it's often... Yeah, I mean, Western this, this, this um, Dying Races conference in Australia is absolutely fascinating for various reasons. As you said, a lot of the, um, I mean, the, the, the figures are absolutely amazing. In, in French Polynesia, there was a population at, at sort of, I mean, there's only real sort of sustained European contact in the Pacific in about the 1820s. And this is American whalers. I'm, I'm bashing the Americans again. And they brought with them, um, obviously, syphilis and, and all, 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 the, all the illnesses to which the Pacific, which had been isolated from Africa and Eurasia for, for, forever, uh, had no resistance to, to or, and also the knowledge how to treat these diseases. So a, a lot of the, 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 the problems for the, these populations, as I said, going from in French Tahiti from 177,000 to 20,000 in only about 50 years. I mean, you look at the Maoris, when the, the British arrived, they, they were something like uh, 140,000. And by 1840, when the British take over, there's only 20,000 left or something like that. And not just imported diseases, there's also imported guns, um, opium, um, alcohol, um, t tobacco became the most important trading um, substance in, the, in the, a lot of the, the, the Pacific Islands. Um, but there's also one thing which has really surprised me, um, and th these doctors are looking at this, these figures, and they've got these sort of anthropology is sort of moving into the Pacific at this time, which is a, which is a very commendable uh, sort of effort to understand sort of foreign cultures and foreign ways of life. Uh, and what they identify, which is really surprising, is the problem is not just the death rate. The main problem is the birth rate. So what's happened? So they, they study families over three or four generations back from 1923, and they find that three generations ago, people were having four or five children. Okay, not all of them would survive into adulthood, but um, and that, but this goes down and down and down until people are just not having children. And they identify the reason for this is the, the, the psychological damage that the arrival of the European, particularly the missionaries, has done. Because the missionaries arrive and they ban headhunting, they ban dancing, they make people wear completely unhygienic, unsuitable clothes because they don't like the sight of naked people. Dancing is too lascivious. And these, dancing an example, this is a, this is a sort of oral history. This is a way that stories are passed down through the generations. It's, it's a real building block of the culture. And some of this isn't the missionaries fault. There's an example, um, Bronowski, the Argonauts of the, of the Pacific, which had come out the year before, which is a groundbreaking work of anthropology and he studies the Kula people who have this very complicated rituals around building trading canoes 
And there's also, you know, at every stage there are rituals, there are parties, there are celebrations. Um, and of course, with the arrival of the steamer, this, they've become completely obsolete. So all of that has, has collapsed. So, so the culture of these places has been hollowed out by the arrival of the Europeans, not just the arrival of the empire, the arrival of modernity, which was surely inevitable with or without the imperial flag. And so they find they d this is a barren, meaningless world into which they don't want to bring their children anymore. And that, I want to pick up on your last point. You mentioned the word mo modernity. And what I, what I love about the book is that, I mean, you mentioned about the exhaustion of Britain after the First World War um, and the fact, you know, it's financially in a mess. Europe's in a mess. It's declining. But the other half of the story your book shows that the world is... Is, is moving on. Britain supposedly created or unleashed these forces of modernity through education and technology, and these are elements that colonized people are, are now using and pioneering. And it strikes me, you've, you spoke about imperial health, and we're talking about the Rockefellers. And it's almost like Britain is, there are other more powerful countries emerging that are filling that kind of white man's burden. And, and, and in conjunction with these kind of indigenous uh, resistance movements and rising political consciousness, you get a sense, especially in the second half of the book, almost like a palpable, like um, that that Britain is just being overwhelmed and it's it's just kind of losing its kind of um, you know propagandistic psychological edge and it can't compete with new forces in Kenya, in Malaysia, in India and and can't compete with America. It just feels like and it's very timely for how it feels today. Britain is just going down the hierarchy of that. Yeah, there's, there's, certainly, there's certainly a sort of feeling of exhaustion in, in, sort of in London. Um, there's a feeling that um, it, th things are on the wane, even at this moment of, um, of, of sort of peak territorial extent. Um, and certainly in, in, in India, there's a, that, that's a, a particularly vivid case because um, the, the, there were concessions made during the First World War to keep the vital Indian contribution uh, of both men and money flowing into, into the conflict. Um, and that included, of course, the, um, led to the act of, you know, the India, Government of India Act, which gave, which created, gave um, five million Indians the vote and um, created a lot of sort of regional and, and sort of um, regional power for local people. Uh, and, but at the same time, you know, there are concessions given out elsewhere in, in, in Ceylon, in, in the Caribbean as well, towards more autonomy for, for local people. But every time a concession is given, it only leads to demands for more concessions. Uh, which, and so it, it feels like there's an inevitable sort of ball rolling. And as I said, particularly in India, there was a famously, uh, the Prince of Wales did a tour of India in 1921, 22. Uh, and this was part of a sort of global trip that he did. Um, and r r there's, a, there's a reason for this. That I, I talked a little bit about the um, Imperial Conference uh, of the, the, mainly the Dominion leaders with some Indian representatives. And they can't agree on anything. You know, the Dominions also have been promised more autonomy. Um, so, and they can't agree to, so on a, a shared foreign policy. They can't agree or even to support each other in times of war. And all they can agree on that unites the empire is shared loyalty to the monarch. That's all that unites the empire in practical terms. So in order to sort of keep this going, they send um, the Prince of Wales, who later becomes Edward VIII, who's this very photogenic and utterly feeble um, character. Absurd. And, yeah. Absurd. And he goes, he goes to Canada, he, and uh, he's, he's given a welcome, even in the French Canada, where he expected to be roundly booed. Um, he goes to Australia, he goes to New Zealand. In those places, there's sort of, you know, there are, you know, Bolshevism and there are Republicans who plan all these boycotts of his trip, and they all just sort of fade away in the excitement of this famous photogenic figure. In India, it's a different story. He arrives, and instantly um, the Congress call a boycott of the, uh, every event in his trip. Um, and in a lot of cases, this is incredibly effective. Um, and Mamabad, he, he just goes, goes down this empty street, just, and it's all lined. Obviously, it's a security nightmare for the Indian police um, because it takes one person to, uh, to, to throw a bomb. Only in, in princely India, as it was known then, is he given a warm welcome, and not just a warm welcome. They push out, they really uh, spend fortunes on elaborate displays of, 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 of wealth in order to Im impress the prince. Um, but elsewhere in India, there are riots, uh, and, and he, he comes away going, that was a 
disaster. I, I love the fact that he writes, on the day he lands, 10,000 people have been arrested. And it just shows the kind of, you know, the, the absurdity, the, the British image of the loyal colonies, and then what, what's actually the reality. Yeah, they, in, order to, in order to safeguard the prince, they have to actually build, they have to set up new prisons for the, 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 the tens of thousands of people who are potential troublemakers. And the same happens in, in Burma when he goes to Burma as well. Um, but he, he reports back to his father, the king, saying, look, you know, I've been speaking to Indian, um, you know, Anglo-Indian, i.e. white people, uh, whether they're in the army, whether they're in business, whether they're in government, and morale is at rock bottom. They, they, they all saying, we're not going to bring our sons to work in India. It's no longer a place for a white man to be. And there's this feeling that the, the, the game is up. And E.M. Forster, who not, not, not only writing uh, his, his masterpiece, The Passage to India, which I, I use, I look at quite a lot, he's also a, a very um, prolific journalist writing about Indian issues. And he, he, he goes to India before and after the war. He's there in 1912 and he's there in 1921. Uh, and there's a real contrast. Before the, before the war, he finds the, the Anglo-Indians just staggeringly rude and unpleasant uh, about Indian people. Just uh, jaw-dropping, if I can say that. Um, he goes back after the war and the orders have been sent down from above to be nicer. And not in a, he gives an example. His his friend Masood, um, who's India at this time, so it tells him about before the war. If a white man came into my railway carriage, I would give up my seat for him. And now he says he goes in after the war, and um, if he's he, sorry, if he's in the carriage and an Indian comes in, he will get, you know the, the 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 white guy will jump up and offer his seat, saying, "Oh, it's your country." And Masood goes, "Oh, for goodness sake, that's just almost worse," you know. And, and Forster concludes in this beautiful piece, um, it's too late, it's too late. There's been too many generations of unpleasantness and he just calls it rudeness. Obviously, it, it's obviously sometimes more extreme than rudeness, um, but there's, there's certainly there's feeling in India and that feeling is spreading around the empire that you know, the, the, it, we shouldn't really be here, this isn't really sustainable. And I think that the, the way your book links out to developments in Britain itself with increased in franchise and, um, and, and then in, in the empire is remarkable. Um, there's, there's so much I want to say. I mean, I, we're talking about very heavy material, which is appropriate for the book and the theme, absolutely. But I do want to share, because, you know, probably inappropriately, but there are, there are, I was chuckling off and the, the rich source material in its absurdity, some of these figures. So um, if you end up getting the book, you'll be rewarded by some, some really rich stories. And there's just a few, uh, you mentioned a few at the beginning. Um, there's just some I love. So the, this, this tour that the Prince of Wales is sent on to sort of rally the empire in the post-war period, it's like a big... You know, we see that with sort of uh, um, uh, uh, Kate and William recently in a slightly more disastrous PR tour in the Caribbean. But it's along those lines, and it's about you know, okay, if the if the monarch is the only thing keeping the empire together, let's use that. And um, uh, as Matthew mentioned, the Prince of Wales comes across as yeah, this almost uh, I feel like there should be like Benny Hill music playing whenever he's on the page. And there's this period, I think it's Australia or, or South Africa, where he's travelling in a train you know, a very decadent train and it crashes and the Prince of Wales is, is trapped. And instead of, you know, making sure everyone's okay, he grabs for the cocktail shaker and a packet of cigarettes and he climbs out of the door of the crest train. Um, and he's, he's a gallivanter, I believe. Uh, yeah, um, he, he, he sort of... Um... Peter said, you don't leave your DNA usually when you travel the world. The Prince of Wales definitely left his DNA across the world. Yeah, I, think, I mean, he, him and, uh, he, had a, he had a companion, interestingly, along the way, Dickie Mountbatten, obviously yeah. the last Viceroy of India as a, as a young Bad man, boy. and an absolute burk as far as it can be made out. Um, and they would, they would sort of get, they would drink far too much. Um, and it, at dinners, the prince would, instead of sort of dancing with the daughters of all the most important people, he would just pick one and dance with her all night, um, which obviously upset a lot of people. And there was, a, there was one incident when he went to Japan um, which is, uh, we haven't really covered that, but Japan is a massive threat to the empire at this point. Um, but there's a sort of, you know, a friendly diplomatic mission. Uh, and the Japanese had heard about his, uh, the prince's predilection for having informal companionship and had made sure that every woman who came anywhere near him was checked and sanitized. Uh, and there was an absolute outrage when two missionary women approached him to give him a, a Bible translated in Japan, and they were seized and whisked away because they hadn't been they hadn't been properly checked out. 
So that's the kind of man. I mean, this was this is the fault of of picking someone important through birth rather than through merit. Mm. And and I think that's the, the almost the out of touchness of Britain now in this modern world in the early 20th century that people are seeing more and more um, as as they, they become kind of exposed to these. But it's interesting to say that you know even the even though the world was changing and the challenges facing British hegemony were changing, the British themselves seem to still be trapped in this kind of 19th century. And I've got a, a quote from the prince who, when he's in India, um, and he meets some people and, you know, they comment that he's, um, you know, which would have one, once upon a time been perfect imperial ideology that, you know, he is the reincarnation of Akbar, the old Mughal uh, yeah. uh, emperor. And he's horrified by the accusation that he could have been an Indian. And he writes in his diary that, you know, this is, you know, no, this is not what I want at all. It just shows that, you know, that the British are completely ill-equipped to adapt yeah. to this. And I think we're seeing, we're seeing that now. I mean, obviously, there's, a, there's been a big debate in, in Britain about the, the empire and its legacy. But we're seeing now all across um, what used to be the empire, we're seeing people rejecting this old British, old-fashioned sort of attitude and deference, and particularly monarchy. We've seen um, Barbados, of all places, which used to be known as Little England, um, ditching King Charles in, further, in, in, in favor of a Republican constitution. In Australia, there's a debate happening about it too. Um, and across the Caribbean, I mean, Jamaica will surely be next. Um, and the idea of uh, having a head of state who is uh, a white guy sitting 2,000 miles away in London, which is, of course, this, a, a terrible imperial hangover. But people are, are, are rejecting this, and they're saying, well, actually, that, that, that imperial history is holding us back, almost like sort of going back to Nehru. You know, we want yeah. to be genuinely standing on our own feet. Yeah, and, and I think that's one side. The other side is then there's also these enduring colonial legacies. So if you look at Australia recently rejecting the referendum on the voice campaign, preserving some of these old kind of colonial mm. hierarchies uh, and excluding indigenous people from, from kind of constitutional decision making. And, and we could go on for that, but I'm just aware that the clock of doom has now hit eight minutes. So, um, so I mean, first of all, round of applause, I think, for Matthew uh, for his book. Thank you. Um, and, and massive thank you for coming and talking to us about it. So we've got about eight minutes. Um, and can I, I'll, I'll open up for questions. Can I, yeah, definitely no comments, um, um, uh, no egos. We don't want you to hog the floor. Um, just genuine questions that you can throw at Matthew that things you're interested in. So first of all, gentlemen at the front with the red bag, that'd be great, thank you. Thank you, good afternoon. Uh, my question is that in, in your school, do you also teach about the atrocities that the British committed in their colonies to your school children? Um, I, I'm, actually, I'm actually not a school teacher. Um, my son is just training to be one, actually. Um, but anyway, that's irrelevant. Um, what, I, what I do with these, with these, as I said, I sort of find a moment on that day and I sort of use it as a, a leaping off point. And that includes um, fit the background. So how was this situation, for instance, in India in 1923, uh, how, how is this situation being contained? And obviously I go back um, briefly, but actually I do, India kind of sucked my word count, uh, as, as I was warned it would, but I go back to the partition of Bengal and I go through, obviously, the row attacks and everything that happened uh, in Amritsar, um, both, both from the point of view, and then, of course, the non-cooperation non and the m martial law and everything, and I actually spend quite a lot of time on the non-cooperation movement, um, and which, which Nehru is saying in, in, in the end of 1923, is it, that we're, the, uh, the, mo the magic moment has passed because Gandhi's in jail, um, the, the Congress is splitting, it's losing a lot of its Muslim support. Um, and actually, ironically, what is at this moment boosting um, Indian nationalism and reuniting Indian nationalists from lots of different sort of backgrounds is what's happening in Kenya and the humiliation of the Indian community in, in Kenya who are, are being treated appallingly by the white settler community. And Kenya is, Kenya is, the same thing is happening obviously in South Africa, but South Africa is now out of the control of London. Because of the, de of the, the treaty with them, they have no control over domestic policy in South Africa. They do in Kenya. London has a responsibility to people in Kenya. And there's a massive fight between the, the white, the whites actually, the white population, which is not that, but 10,000 or something, actually plan a coup, an armed coup, to get, uh, get rid of the governor and take over the colony, a sort of what later would be called UDI, as happened in Rhodesia. Um, and 
you know, they, the, the British government are in a complete dilemma because they say, what, do we, do we order the, the, the troops, the garrison, who are almost all, all black, to, to, to fire on these, these white settlers? And it's a nightmare. Um, and what happens is a, a sort of mucky compromise where, where Devonshire, who's the, who's the colonial secretary, says, um, actually, African interests are paramount. So we're not going. We're not backing either the Asians or the whites. And this is a complete fudge. And actually, nothing is done to improve African. But they get away with it. But this really re reignites and brings moderates back into the the, the, the sort of anti-British camp. P people like VVS Sastry say, like, I'm undeceived because of the decision. I'm undeceived about about you know the Britain. The, the government is paying lip service to. Um, racial equality. Sastry himself put through at the 1921 Imperial Conference a motion that all of the subjects of the empire were equal regardless of their race or their communities. And this is shown to be um, hogwash. And, and it, even moderates like him, Anglophile moderates like him, are now sort of prompted to, to, to protest. Um, it, I mean, it's a good question. I, I mean, I teach, and, and yes, I do, but there's a thing in the UK, not just the UK, but elsewhere, about how we tell that history. It's very controversial. There's, uh, again, UK is not alone. There are, it's politicised. There are kind of cultural wars taking place in a kind of more public conversation. It, uh, uh, you, know, associate, you know, this is just telling a, dif a, a different side that has rarely been told, and yet, to some instances, it's doing Britain down. You know, uh, we should be proud about our empire. You know, a recent poll suggested that half the population still think about the British Empire from a place of pride, which uh, which has been teaching is is far more progressive. Uh, most academics do do teach about. I mean, I, I teach entire courses on it, but I think there's a lag between what academics are doing and the public conversation around imperial legacies and atrocity, um, and you know. And that's, I think that's a, that's a very controversial place in the UK. I don't know how well we're doing it compared to other countries. We're not alone in doing it. But uh, anyway, thanks for the question. Let's, let's, uh, let's move on. Um, yeah, lady in the blue, just uh, third row. Thank you. We've still got a few minutes, so a few questions. So just taking off from what you just now said, um, don't you think that uh, Britain has yet to come to terms with the loss of its empire because uh, there has, in fact, been a reification of uh, imperial nostalgia. I mean, uh, I do read a lot of the British media, and I find that uh, there is a complete nostalgia still that we made India. And uh, anybody who counters that, uh, you know, uh, is, is, is just uh, subject to a lot of criticism. So, uh, as you said, that, uh, you know, this is something which is confined to the academic fraternity perhaps, but maybe there's been a reification in the British public domain, especially because of the resurgence of India. So, a very quick... Uh, I think that's, that's a, very, a very good point. Um, and certainly, um, all the, the, the sort of debate about Brexit and how we, we, we don't need Europe because we're this global Britain. And that is pure empire nostalgia. Um, and it's, it's sort of slightly embarrassing and offensive, really. Um, but this is, this is quite a small part of the commentariat, I'd say. I mean, they, I think they get more sort of airtime because, because it's a sort of, it's a stirry subject. And, and, you know, there was a very interesting talk I went to by, by Malcolm Turnbull, who was talking about media becoming, not, not reporting, but just trying to sort of stimulate anger and sort of excitement among its, among its consumers rather than reporting. Um, and I think that's an element of that. But also, I think that people have a lot to learn. I think, you know, that things have changed a lot. And I hope that books like mine, which are aimed at a, a, a large readership um, and obviously rely on a lot of work by people like David in the archives. Um, yeah, we nick some stuff from these academics. Um, and I hope it will change, change minds. And one of the things, the sort of themes that emerged from my, you know, this huge selection of, of primary sources was this recurring idea of ignorance. And Indian Sastry, who I was talking about earlier, he, comes in, he came to England and said, I'm astonished, no one knows anything. They're actually proud of their ignorance about India and what's happening in India. And E.M. Forster, who you know, absolutely threw himself in it, he says the same thing, it's a disgrace that people actually working in India have no interest in India or the Indians around them. Um, and the same is true, was true in Malaya and so on. And this is something that I draw out in the book, and I hope it sort of, it, it sort of suggests that by reading books like this and by coming to festivals like this, we can all learn and, and get rid of that lack of understanding, which was so bad for everyone involved. 
I th and, I, and I think that's the problem is that th there is, and if you read British media, it is abysmal. But you often have, they're not historians talking about the legacy of the British Empire. They're, you know, political scientists, sorry, political scientists, they're economists, they, you know, they're theologians. And, um, you know, and, 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 it, and they don't know anything about the topic. And it's very easy to refute those, but these are the sorts of people writing the op-eds in the Sunday Times or whatever. And, and therefore, I think historians like Matthew, like myself and others, have an obligation to step into these kind of, these, these books and to, and to educate. But I think really the biggest challenge is ignorance because most people don't. And when they talk about the British Empire, they're not talking about history, they're talking about identity and politics. And, and we're at a particular place in the UK, especially where that has become and is ramping up and it serves a particular group of people. It's not about education, it's not about knowledge, it's not about enlightenment, it's about politics. And it's a shame, but um, you know, uh, these kind of books. And One Fine Day is a fantastically nuanced, wonderful story that educates. Mine less so. I'm not interested in nuance. I'm shouting an argument down people's faces. So if you enjoy that thing, get my book. But Matthew's done it, I think, slightly more sensitive way. We've got about 30 seconds. Lady on, on the end there. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, I've been settled in the US for uh, 35 years, but I feel the British still hangs on to the romanticism of the British Raj, while India has moved forward and you have become almost irrelevant. Do you think that? I'll leave that one for Matthew. Um, yeah, I mean, there was an interesting debate, actually it was a few years ago now, um, where people were, someone, someone said, um, why are we giving aid to India when they have a space program? Um, which, which sort of I thought, you know, was quite interesting. Um, I, I do think that, you know, it, it was big news when the Indian population sort of grew past China, that massive, massive news. And I, I saw in the paper that, that you're expecting sort of 7% growth or something next year. Um, and, you, you know, we have a lot of, we're, we're, we're desperate to get, you know, tech savvy young Indians into our, into our country to help our, our tech sector. Um, and, you know, we, we have an Indian Prime Minister, uh, Indian Heritage Prime Minister, um, so... Yay! <laughs> Sorry. What's amazing about that is no one really, comment, no one really commented. We have, a, we have an a Asian Heritage Mayor of London, we have an Asian Heritage Head of Scotland, you know, no one really cares. I do, I do think people feel, I think British people feel that India is special in the British story, and that we should have a, a, a unique bond um, and I, at, the end of, at the end of my book, I, I go to E.M. Forster's um, Passage to India, um, which, and the central story of that is the friendship. Is friendship possible? I, I, I don't know if you know the book, but is friendship possible between an Indian and a British? And there's this guy, Aziz, who's been accused of, of a crime, and his one defender is this guy, Fielding. Um, and right at the end of the book, they're, they're, they're sort of squabbling about politics. And, and Aziz, you know, Fielding says, oh, we can't go because, you, you, you know, there'll be disaster. You will hate each other. And Aziz says, we may hate each other, but we hate you more. <laughs> well, um, they're, they're amassing on the margins. I think and, and then, and then I'm, I must just finish with this. And then, and then Fielding says, well, can't we be friends? Can't we be friends? You want to be my friend. I want to be your friend. And force ends. Um, but then they, their horses were forced apart by a rock. And everywhere, the carrion, the trees, they all said, not yet. Uh, and and I hope now we can be friends. <laughs> A round of applause. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, everyone. And those standing you. at the back, it's been a pleasure. And hopefully see you throughout the day.